<laughs> Man, this game sure does suck ass. I don't even know why I'm playing this. Hello. <gasps> who? Get, get out! Who are you? Uh, I'm a uh, sports guy. Are you now, huh? You're trying to you're trying to convince me that it genuinely that it's your real fucking name. No, 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 no! Just tell me why. The fuck you're in my house right now! Well, I remember that one video you made on Mario and Sonic. Oh my god, dude! Like, what the fucking what? It's been four fucking. You know what? Give me that! God! Game's not here. Quite incredible just how many sports Mario and his friends excel at for there to be so many different kinds of Mario sports games. Tennis, soccer, basketball, dodgeball, hockey, golf, and even horse racing. But one sport that isn't talked about a lot in his sports career is baseball. He only got two shots at it with Mario Superstar Baseball on GameCube released in 2005, and Mario Super Sluggers three years later on the Wii. After that, we didn't get any new Mario baseball games to this day. Unless you count Mario Sports Superstars. <laughs> it only released in the US, Japan, and Taiwan, which is really strange. Europe didn't get a single release of this game, which means at the time of this video, they've gone about 18 years without a new baseball game. Jeez! Maybe it was because baseball isn't a popular sport in Europe? I suppose that would kind of make sense, but come on. People don't just play these games for the sports themselves, but also because Mario games tend to add a lot more depth to them, as well as bringing along that Mario charm to make for a great experience altogether. Oh, uh... Hello? Hello, am I speaking to, uh, Ahmed? So, yeah, hello, you're speaking with a representative of the WDDN, which stands for Wacky Decisions Department of Nintendo, and we saw you pop up on our WQODR, or People Who Questioned Our Decisions Radar, and we wanted to send you a quick video as to why we decided that Europe should not get a release of this particular video game. Oh, um... Okay... Hello, my disturbingly tall son. It's 2008 in London, United Kingdom today. I know that, Dad. You don't have to say that every time. Yeah, whatever. Well, I decided to give you a gift to people who playing video games, so... Happy non-descriptive holiday of 2008. I love Mario. Well, if that were me, I would've just not done that, so... Whether you're from Europe or not, I'll be taking a look back at this childhood game of mine and showing you what it's all about and what made it so great to play. Now, just a disclaimer, I've only played Super Sluggers, so if you're looking for a comparison between Superstar Baseball and Super Sluggers and what they might have changed between those two games, you're probably gonna have to look somewhere else. The game begins with this really amazing opening cinematic, giving you a taste of the excitement that lies within it. Ooh, I can't wait to play Barrel Basher! I honestly really like the progression of the movie. It starts from Mario and friends taking the cruise ship to Baseball Kingdom, to everyone being amazed at the scenery on top of the lighthouse, to beginning the games themselves. There's a lot of great antics here with the Mario gang, and it's always a great treat to watch. The icing on the cake is definitely the last part where DK tackles Luigi at home base, knocking him all the way to the end of the stage, only to still have the ball in his hand getting him out. All in all, a great way to open up the game. After choosing a save file, we're told that it's best to go to practice mode first to learn the controls, but since I played this as a kid, I probably won't need them too much. Let's start off with the challenge mode, which serves as the game's story mode. The game throws us right into Baseball Kingdom, introducing Lakitu, who essentially serves as a tour guide. Apparently this entire island was built by Peach just so they could play baseball. Look, Peach, are you gonna address the inflation or not? Afterwards, a cutscene plays where Bowser Jr. literally surfs an entire toy castle and slams it into the island, allowing him to invade and attempt to take it over. Afterwards, Bowser Jr. and his minions invade all the ballparks, and it's up to us to stop him from his antics and amass a baseball team that can take him down. The plot is really cute, it's super goofy, and the game taking it in stride just gives all the more charm. But uh, I gotta ask, why do Boo and Shy Guy come out of the castle? They're part of Wario Yoshi 
these baseball teams respectively. Pretty strange. Anyways, after Bowser Jr.'s invasion, Mario and Luigi head inside Mario's stadium. Luigi says he couldn't find any minions, but we still have to keep an eye out for them and begin searching for teammates. So yeah, that's essentially the objective of the story, to gather teammates from different ballparks to take on Bowser Jr. To do that, we have to roam around the ballparks, interact with certain objects, help people out with their troubles from Bowser Jr., and eventually get a team big enough to take him on. There are also certain things you can't do without the captains of other ballparks. For example, you won't be able to interact with metallic objects without Wario, or inspect trees without Yoshi. Mario can jump through pipes, DK can break boxes and barrels, and Peach can use the power of love? Yeah, some abilities are weird. For some reason, only Mario can inspect bushes, in the weirdest way, too. Just talks to it and someone comes out or he gets coins. I mean, I guess I never really gave it a try. In order to convince most of the players to join your team in each ballpark, you'll need to prove your worth, since most people think going against Bowser Jr.'s team is crazy and require a strong team to take down. I mean, come on, what did you think they'd say otherwise? Sure! Let's go kill ourselves! In order to recruit them, each character has a challenge that you need to defeat in order to have them join your team. This is definitely one of my favorite parts of this mode. The way the game gradually teaches and tests your abilities with the mechanics of the game. It makes learning the game feel rewarding, fun, and allows you to become familiar with specific abilities abilities you might not find from the normal practice mode, such as Yoshi's tongue catch that allows you to catch balls from far away, hitting to specific parts of the field based on the timing of your swing, and the buddy toss mechanic which allows you to throw the ball quickly to a base in order to just barely get an out for the opposing team. By the end, you'll become somewhat a master of the game because of this, and will make you feel prepared for the final fight with Bowser Jr. Oh yeah, oftentimes Bowser Jr.'s minions will block your path from a piece of treasure, keep a player captive, or block an important object. In order to defeat them, you'll also have to defeat their mission. And I gotta say, it's really goofy how they just kinda disappear after you defeat them as if they're above breaking their word and don't just try to use force to get what they want. <laughs> to his minions, Bowser Jr. himself will cause havoc at all the ballparks. He takes over Mario Stadium, keeps Birdo, Tiny Kong, and Peach captive, and causes a foggy mess in Wario City. Fuck, that's one hell of a criminal record. In order to stop him, you'll need to clear your path to the ballpark and then beat him in a one-inning ball game while already at a disadvantage, which is actually pretty challenging. After getting the ballpark back, you'll have it all for yourself again, but that doesn't mean you could just sweep the area. You still have to find the captains of all the other ballparks in order to truly complete each ballpark due to every captain's unique abilities, which adds some nice depth to the game. Now, you don't have to complete all the ballparks to take on Bowser Jr. Once you have enough players for a baseball team, you can immediately challenge him. However, I decided to continue through the whole thing Thing, just for how enjoyable it is, and to really get fully comfortable with the game's mechanics. Wow, it's almost like the Breath of the Wild. The dialogue also has a great sense of humor. In particular, this game has a weird obsession with the goofy phrases the characters use when something bad happens. Baloney burritos, dirty socks, tough beans, peanut breath, sharp shit balls, greasy goulash, worm germs, crusty cheese curds, moldy popcorn, and my personal favorite, oh fuck! There are also item shops where you can spend your coins on equipment items that can give your players stat boosts that only work in challenge mode. But I never really cared for them, so I just didn't get them until I beat the game. However, there are other items that allow you to unlock two new ballparks, Daisy Cruiser and Luigi's Mansion, which is pretty cool. This is also how you unlock an exhibition mode, so if you want all the ballparks to play in, you'll need to play the story mode first. Now, of course, before talking about the ending, I should also talk about the actual gameplay and the mini games this game has to offer, so let's get to it! Let's just start off with acknowledging just how huge this roster is. This game has 42 different characters to choose from, and if you count color variations, you're actually left with 72 characters on the entire roster. That's a number that beats Smash Ultimate's base roster, which is absolutely insane, especially since this game was released in 2008. The character selection itself is also really great. Interestingly, this game has a more Mario Sunshine inspired roster rather than Mario Galaxy, despite it being released a year after that game. Perhaps the developers didn't get any exposure to Mario Galaxy during the game's creations, so that would probably explain why that's the case. Alongside the usual classic Mario characters, we have a bunch of fan favorites like Daisy, Birdo, Drybones, Shy Guy, Waluigi, and both Boo and King Boo. I mean, 
It's a little excessive. And in addition, there are a ton of oddball or unique picks for the game, which make it a lot more interesting, like the tons of Donkey Kong characters, Petey Piranha, Magic Koopas, Goombas, and Paragoombas. They don't even have <laughs> they don't even have hands, goddammit. Nokis, Piantas, Monty Mole, the list goes on and on. With so many characters to choose from, it'll be hard to not find at least one that will appeal to you, which is great since players will need to choose a lot of characters for their baseball team. Now what's interesting about all these characters is that they have varying stats, which gives the game an extra layer of strategy with your choices. After choosing them, you'll also need to decide on your players' positioning on the field wisely. Now I know I just praise the game a lot for how well the challenge mode teaches you the game's mechanics, but there's still a lot that the game just flat out doesn't explain. The stats in particular are extremely unclear and misleading, which makes it really hard to understand how you strategize your character picks and placements. The practice mode doesn't even explain what these stats even are, so you essentially have to go off of assumptions if you didn't do internet research? What does the ball mean? Pitching speed? The glove is... catching, maybe? Or maybe it's throwing speed? I don't know what that means! It turns out that the explanations for these are actually a bit complicated. The ball is the pitching stat, but it doesn't equate to speed. It basically determines which characters have more flexibility with how they can move the ball around after it's thrown. The batting stat is a bit more self-explanatory in the sense that the higher your batting stat, the more likely you'll be able to hit the ball really far. However, it is absolutely not clear that this also generally determines your throwing speed on the field, which you might assume is what the fielding stat is for, but nope. It's all in the batting stat. The fielding stat is a bit weird in the sense that it pretty much only tells you what the bobble rate is, meaning that a low fielding stat will make you screw up catching the ball more. While that is important, you also want to press 1 to see some of the other abilities the characters can use on the field. The last one is the one that makes the most sense, which is just running speed, both on the field and on the bases. Even with this, I was wondering if the field stat equated to running speed on the field, but it turns out that it's universal. Now there's one more important factor when it comes to player positioning, which is chemistry. You see these music notes on these characters when you hover over one of your players? That indicates chemistry, which is essentially how well your players get along with one another. If a player has chemistry with another player, they'll have the ability to do a buddy toss, which allows you to throw the ball really far, and a buddy jump, which can deny home run hits from your opponent, which makes it essential to have your outfielders have chemistry. And finally, after selecting your preferences for the game, Now, during an exhibition match, your time will be spent either pitching, fielding, or batting. I'll start by talking about the pitching and fielding. Your goal with pitching should be to get a strikeout by making your pitches as difficult as possible. Since Boo and King Boo have great pitching stats, they can make the ball move around a lot more, so I always have them pitching whenever possible. There are a lot of variations of pitching that you can choose. You can go for a normal pitch by shaking the Wiimote, a charged pitch by shaking the Wiimote backwards and then forwards once the circles here align, a change-up pitch which is done by shaking the Wiimote while holding the A button, and a star pitch which is done by holding the A and B button while shaking the Wiimote. With all of these, you can manipulate the ball's course of direction by tilting the nunchuck analog stick. It's pretty cool how even something as simple as pitching the ball has so much depth in this game. But I gotta say, it's pretty weird how you can move the ball around with the analog stick to just change the direction of the ball mid-throw. Uh-oh, here comes the ball. I mean, I've heard of curveballs, but this is ridiculous. But when you're not trying to strike someone out, you're going to be fielding to get someone out while they're running the bases. There are tons of character-specific abilities that will help you catch the ball, like Yoshi's Tongue Catch, Hammer Bros, Magic, Gravitational Pulling thing? or Donkey Kong's Wall Climb. If your character doesn't have any of these, that's also okay, because all characters can still do a diving catch, which can help you catch balls when you're about to barely miss it, a jump to catch balls midair, and, of course, the aforementioned buddy toss and buddy jump, as long as you have chemistry of the two players involved. Though, one thing you have to watch out for are the error items, which the opponent can shoot at you while you're fielding. Some items you can attack with the B button to get rid of, while others you can just jump over to avoid. There are also star hits in which you'll need to strategize how to deal with effectively, since some of them can be really difficult to catch while in the air. When it comes to your turn to bat, you'll notice this cursor above the base. Flinging the Wiimote backwards will have you charge the bat as the reticle shrinks, and shaking it again will have you swing. You can also bunt by holding the Z, but bunting is kind of...
By holding A and B while swinging, you can do a star swing, which varies with captains, but is universal for all other characters. Captain star swings can be really good since so they have an effect to them that can make them really difficult to catch. As for after you hit the ball, there's not much or more you can do except shoot items and run the bases. Pointing the Wiimote to the screen and pressing Z will help you aim and shoot your items if you have any, and you have to shake the Wiimote to go quicker on the bases. Pressing A will help you advance more bases, and pressing B will let you stop and then go backwards if you press it a second time. Controlling a specific character has you choose the direction your character is going on the nunchuck so the other characters on the bases aren't interrupted. So all in all, the gameplay is really freaking good and holds up really well today. It's still a blast to play alone, and with others, there's enough variety here that makes it a deep yet simple game to understand. There's also a ton of variety with different ballparks you can play on. You do have the normal Mario Stadium with no gimmicks, but on top of that, there's Yoshi Park, which have these pipes that can make the ball warp and a train in the back, Wario City, which has all these geysers, DK's Jungle, which have these flowers that make you dizzy and barrels rolling all over the place, Peach's Ice Garden, which has freezies, Daisy Cruiser, which have these tables blocking the way and the giant blooper tipping the boat over at night, Luigi's Mansion, which has ghosts, Bowser Jr.'s Playroom, which have chain chomps and bullet bills roaming about, and Bowser's Castle, which have lava spills on the field. And they didn't even mention nighttime variants for a handful of these stages. With so many ballparks to choose from, there's a practically endless amount of replay value the game has. And this replay value doesn't even stop with the exhibition mode! Yeah, think about all the content that I just told you about. A variety of ballparks, a baseball formula with a ton of depth, an entire story mode, and Nintendo still said, the kids will never get into gambling like this. In addition to the exhibition mode, the game has this extra game mode called Toy Field. It's basically almost like a party mode where players have to rack up as many points as possible. In Toy Field, you pick a single character from the roster rather than select an entire team to be pitted against each other. Your goal is to essentially be up to bat as frequently as possible in order to get as many opportunities to add to your point total. If you're not batting, you'll be choosing the speed of the ball, the direction of the ball, or the item the batter gets. After you hit the ball, you want it to land on as many of these number tiles as possible, especially the ones in the back that give you a ton of points. You also want to aim your hit well to make sure nobody else gets the ball so you can bat again, which is pretty difficult since you'll need to use your item extremely effectively while doing so. What you definitely don't want to happen is to get a ball caught before it lands, because if you get an out, you actually lose points instead of gaining them, which can be pretty devastating. This also goes for getting strikes. For every strike you get, you have to donate some extra coins to all the other players. Now for the ones that are fielding, their goal is to ensure that they get the opportunity to try and catch the ball so that they can bat up next. If another player has the ball, you're gonna have to try and attack them with the B button before they get away with it, before the time runs out, which can be a pretty difficult thing to do. There's also this jackpot tile where everyone plays this quick minigame to get a bunch of coins. I just found this one strange, so the minigames just kind of consist of pick the right box or pop the balloons lower than X number. These really simplistic games that don't really have anything to do with baseball always feel out of place, and it's just odd to me how it's even called a jackpot when there's a good chance the batter who got it in the first place might not even get it. Anyways, Toy Field can go on for 10, 20, or 30 turns depending on what you choose before it. And once they're all over, there are bonuses the game gives out at the end to give a last chance boost to people who fell behind just before the winner is declared. In short, this mode is really fun and is a great alternative to the exhibition mode. It's fast paced, hectic, and still a blast to play even today. And it didn't even stop there! After Nintendo finished with Toy Field, they basically said, I mean, Wow, this is a pretty good job, y'all, and. Oh, uh, wait. Yeah, y'all forgot bullshit. Yeah, good job, good job. Come on, back to work now. I know what you're thinking. You may be wondering where I'm getting this exclusive intel from. We didn't even talk about any of the minigames this game has to offer, and oh boy, there are a lot of them. Now, I will have to disclaim that the quality with these minigames aren't all top-notch like the rest of the content I showed off in this video. However, there are still some good ones that are fairly fun to play. One of the more mediocre ones is Piranha Panic. You'll have to throw the ball to the left, right, straight forward, or do a change-up to throw upwards depending on where the Piranha Plant's head is. It's really not that hard. Sometimes the Piranha Plant will pull a Shy Guy Says and put its head in one direction and then change its mind midway, but it's not like there's a strict reaction time like in Shy Guy says, so you can just kind of wait until it stays still. A star pitch hits the piranha plant no matter what and clouds everyone else's piranha plants, but it doesn't really do much since they can still see where it is. This minigame just lacks so much death that it ends up being a really forgettable experience. Gem Catch is a minigame that takes place in Wario City, where you have to catch these gems using fielding mechanics. You need to catch as many as possible to maximize your point score. However, there are also items that'll try to get in your way, as well as these platinum gems that require a buddy jump to catch. This one isn't anything too special, there really isn't any reason to play this over the exhibition mode, just for how it's literally just normal fielding. Oh what, you all don't eat milk without the cereal? 
You know, this will go great with mayonnaise. Barrel Basher is the DK jungle minigame, and it's another high score game, except a lot harder. You need to hit the ball in the direction of the barrels and bombs that are hurtling towards you. The earlier you hit, the more it travels to the direction of the base you're at. The later you hit it, the more opposite to your side it travels. This one is honestly pretty solid. It can require a good amount of practice to master the timing of your swings, and it's fairly fun. I mean, it's not the kind of game I'd have relapse issues with, but it's a good time. I gotta bash more barrels, man! The next one is Wall Ball, which is Peach's Ice Garden. It's an okay mini game. You have to charge your pitches in a way so that you make sure the last wall you break is a pink wall so you can maximize your score. Getting a Bowser wall hit last causes you to lose points. Whoever has the most points by the end wins. It's pretty simplistic, nothing too special, but it's also an alright time. bob -omb Derby, a Mario Stadium minigame, is yet another high score based minigame where you have to aim to hit these bombs in the direction of the sparklers to maximize points. It really isn't anything too special and there isn't too much else to say. If you like Barrel Basher, you'll probably like this one as well. Yes! 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 Blooper base run on Daisy Cruiser is honestly not that good. Use base running mechanics to try and grab as many coins as possible, which is creative, I'll give them that, but there's just not enough depth here to make it interesting. The blooper in the middle does try to hurt you, and there are stars that can help you go through its tentacles and knock down other players, but in the end, it all boils down to just being in the right place at the right time. Ghost K is also really not that great either. It controls similarly to Piranha Panic, except you need to hit ghosts of your player's color for more points. It just feels really sloppily made, and it's just not that fun. Oh no, that's it, dude. Oh, what? Bowser's pinball is alright. It's pretty much just pinball with a baseball bat. Nothing too special to take count of. It's okay at best. My favorite minigame, however, is Graffiti Runner. This one honestly stands out from the rest a lot, and I forgot just how nostalgic this minigame was to me just for how long it's been since I played it. You basically have to fight over the magic paintbrush between yourself and your opponents to make sure you paint the floor more than them. You can also make a circle and jump inside of it to fill it in, which can help give you a massive edge in the competition. With a bunch of items in the treasure chest that can shake things up, it makes for a very hectic and fun minigame, which I wish was a theme with the rest of the minigame pack in this game. Now there is a mode called Minigame Madness where you compete with other players to win as many minigames as possible among five randomly chosen minigames. Now you may be wondering how they make high score minigames work for the minigames that are meant to be single player, and the answer is they take turns, but there are small things that you can do to interact with the person playing the minigame, like grow trees to make these barrels change direction, and changing the trajectory of the ball in bob -omb Derby doesn't really change the monotony, though. So yeah, unfortunately Graffiti Runner is the only minigame really worth playing here, and that's a shame, because the other minigames have some pretty good ideas, it's just that they're too simple, and... I think some complexity would have helped them a lot. But I know what you're all thinking. What about the fucking war, asshole? After getting all the players, we choose our team and face off against Bowser Jr. in his toy room. Wow, I really destroyed them, getting an 8-0 on my first try. I guess those countless attempts at beating Bowser Jr. in the other ballparks paid off. And of course, Bowser Jr. does what any small child would do when they felt wronged, call his dad to beat the shit out of us instead. Day turns to night, and Bowser Jr.'s toy castle is submerged into the ocean just before Bowser's castle emerges directly after. Bowser then challenges us to a game, and we're given the opportunity to prepare ourselves just like last time. However, since I already have all the characters in the ballparks, I just decided to go immediately. And yeah, this one wasn't too bad either. I ended up winning 8-1 pretty easily on my first try, too. Afterwards, Bowser just says, I didn't lose, I just wasn't concentrating. <laughs> oh. We get a cutscene of Mario and the gang celebrating the victory, while Bowser is very... Downhearted. They exit the castle, Peach lights up the entire stadium with her... Power. And then... <laughs> Credits. Not a bad ending, but man, part of me was hoping they'd make up with Bowser and invite him to have fun with the gang. Except that actually does happen. Uh, you do have to go back into challenge mode and challenge Bowser again, and beat him again, to get an extra cutscene and dialogue. So, like, I, I don't really know why they didn't just... Give it to us in the first place, just reiterating past content, but sure, let, let's go over it. <laughs> Essentially, we just rematch Bowser and he says he'll be unleashing his quote-unquote true power. And of course, we destroy him, and then he gets super upset saying that he 
actually tried this time. He was just about to vow for vengeance, but Peach steps in and invites him to play with them. After a bit of nagging from Bowser Jr., he agrees, and the same cutscene from before gets played, followed by a new cutscene where Bowser and Bowser Jr. attend a party hosted by Peach. I honestly adore this segment so much. They look so awkward, shy, and embarrassed at the table from the whole ordeal while everyone is celebrating. <laughs> it's absolutely adorable. Then afterwards, Mario's playing Bob Bomb Derby, and Wario and Waluigi try to prank him by putting a bullet bill instead. But then, Bowser jumps in and saves Mario by swinging at it with his bat, reflecting it towards them and having them explode in the sky. What an actual spectacular ending. We've seen Bowser get invited to festivities before in Mario Party DS, but god damn. I don't think I've ever seen a situation where Bowser literally saves Mario in any game. Truly something special. Mario Super Sluggers is an absolutely fantastic time. The game holds up really well and it's still a blast to play with friends even nowadays. Although it does show its age sometimes. It's a damn shame Europe didn't get this one. It's an even bigger shame that we haven't got a new game since its release. Hopefully one day we'll get a new entry to the series that actually has content. So, you happy now, creep? Um, I didn't really like the way you talked about the minigames, but it was really fun. And I will, I will never forgive you and, and for talking about the game and Mario and Sonic. Oh, really? So, with all that,